Yes. All right. Cool. Thank you for a few minutes. All right. Testing. Testing. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Mm -mm. All righty. We'll start right now. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Josh here, uh, room monitor for uh, Jacob Villarreal. Is there a good guy? Give him a clap. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, presentation today, let's see if we can get a little closer to this. Presentation today is going to be the Spice of Encryption, DP API. He's going to explain a little bit more about all those details as well. And then before we start here, just giving some shout outs to the sponsors. Some of them we have is Deloitte, we have Accenture, USAA, Arctic Wolf, and Swimlane. The rest you can check them out, of course, inside your pamphlet. Again, this is Jacob Billy Real. Hey, everybody. Uh, first, thanks for, for joining me. So, um, I do offensive security work as a consultant. Um, I was on a red team and our client wanted us to also do an assessment uh, related to the password manager on Microsoft Edge. So pretty much just kind of the risk of Microsoft Edge. Um, so whenever I was looking into the Microsoft Edge password manager, um, I kept seeing references to DPAPI or DPAPI. Um, I didn't really know what it was, uh, but I couldn't just tell the client, yeah, I use the DPAPI. And so I had to dig deeper into uh, what this is, uh, which led me into this talk. And uh, just a little bit about me. I've uh, got a few years in IT. Uh, like I mentioned, I do offensive security consulting. Uh, so pen test, uh, red, purple teaming. Um, and before that, I was sysadmin and then um, uh, good old-fashioned help desk. Got a couple of certs. And then uh, there's my contact information as well, uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Um, I also have a couple of uh, offensive security uh, YouTube videos that go like step-by-step -step on a lot of the common attacks that I do, um, in case you're ever interested in that. Um, just a small channel, though. Uh, so what we'll be talking about, uh, just an overview of how the PAPI works, uh, just some basic uh, encrypt and decrypt code. Uh, and then we'll talk about how the browsers store the credentials and how we're able to dump those credentials. And then uh, real quick, we'll talk about uh, using that for possible privilege escalation and SCCMs in a uh, credentials. And then uh, domain persistence by getting the backup key by um, the domain controller. So uh, we use the PAPI. I've mentioned a few, which are uh, password managers by browsers. So Chrome, Chromium-based browsers like Edge and um, Brave, uh, KeePass. You can get Wi-Fi passwords. Uh, the .rdg files for remote desktop managers, um, OpenVPN, so a lot of stuff. And as you'll kind of start knowing more about it, you'll just see this the PAPI word more often, and you'll kind of just realize it's out there more than you thought, which is uh, the case for me whenever I was learning about the SCCM stuff. Uh, so just to give a brief overview, uh, the PAPI is commonly used because it's a really easy way to encrypt and decrypt uh, data on a machine, so it's really easy for developers who don't want to create that whole process themselves to just use this built-in Windows uh, process called the PAPI, and uh, it's really easy, which is why it's pretty common. There's two main methods, which is the protect, as you might imagine, is used for encryption, and then unprotect, which would be for decryption. And there's uh, two scopes or um, values that you can set, which will either be the current user or the local machine. So if you set uh, the encryption to the current user, then only that current user can decrypt the data. And same thing for local machine. So if you set it to local machine, then uh, any user on that machine, on that specific machine, can decrypt the data. And uh, another thing to note is if you start reading a lot of blogs, sometimes there'll be a lot of confusion between what's called a master key and a session key. Uh, so the important thing to know whenever we get into the uh, more details is that the session key is actually what does the decryption and encryption, not the master key. It's a very bad name because the master key actually doesn't decrypt or unlock anything, but it's a session key that does all the encryption and decryption. Um, and then, of course, at the end, we'll talk about the backup key and how it's used uh, in domain environments. Um, and we'll go more details on that uh, towards the end. So one of the first uh, things we can talk about is the CRED file. And this one, as the name implies, is a file that has a history of uh, the user's credentials. So every time that the user uh, changes their password, their new password goes at the top of the file, and the file is encrypted by the user's password. So it goes at the top of the file, 
wants to change it again, the new password goes on top of the file, and each of those are used to decrypt the previous one. And I also have the location of that as well. Um, in order to see the file, it's hidden, but you have to do the dash force. Like even if you have the folders to show hidden, it won't show, so you have to do ls dash force. Uh, but it's there. And then uh, the master key and the master key file. So there's a, also another file on your computer called the master key file, and inside there is the master key. And the master key has its own ID or GOID number, and that's how uh, the computer is able to tell which uh, blob, and whenever you do encryption, it's called blobs, the Pappy blob. So that's what the decryption of the data is called. So each blob has an ID related to the master key that encrypted it. So in order to find out which master key you know, decrypt it, you need a GUID. But the way the master key is encrypted is it gets the password from the LSA process, which is always running whenever you're logged in. And it uses that and puts it into a password-based key function, which also adds um, some salt and then a number of iterations. So with that, it creates or encrypts the master key. And on the uh, diagram on the side, that's the process for decrypting it. So if you need to decrypt that master key file to get the master key, it goes through that process in the diagram. It uh, gets the current password, tries to decrypt the master key file. If it fails, then it goes back to that cred file, gets the previous password, goes through the process again. If it fails again, just loops back around until the master key uh, gets decrypted, which will pass into uh, the session key. So the session key, like I mentioned, is the one that actually does the encryption and decryption. And uh, in order to create the mass, uh, in order to uh, generate the session key, it uses the master key, uh, some random data, and entropy, which is optional. So entropy is just kind of like an additional secret or additional password uh, that will be passed into it. And you'll kind of see that in whenever we look at the code. But uh, that's optional. Uh, it does sound really secure, but one thing to know is that if the process does use entropy, uh, that secret is also stored on the computer. So it's not super secret, it's just a, another layer of security. And uh, the random data that gets used uh, gets stored in the blob. So the blobs are um, opaque, so they're not completely uh, unreadable. If you look at the blobs, you could get certain information out of it, like the master key GUID, along with the random data. So every time it creates the session key, it looks at the blob, it sees what's the random data, it uses that to uh, generate the session key. And uh, gets the encrypted blob and then puts that to plain text. So here's kind of a step back overview of the whole process. So gets the password from LSA, goes to that um, password-based key function. Uh, tries to decrypt the master key if it fails, cred file loops back, and then um, goes to session key, decrypts the encrypted blob. And so, uh, looking a little bit at the code, uh, here's those two methods that I mentioned, the protect, which uh, encrypts the data, and then the unprotect, which decrypts the data. And those have a couple of things that you could pass through there, such as, of course, the user data, so the information that you'll be encrypting and decrypting. Uh, the optional entropy, which again, would just be another string that you add to it another like secret or password you could think of it. Uh, and then the scope, which goes at the end where you'll specify if you want it to be just the local machine or the current user. And also on the bottom is uh, uh, a link to uh, more information about it as well. And so here's a basic uh, code for just encrypting and decrypting. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, which is why it's so good to use for developers who just want something quick and easy and built in. Uh, you just put the string that you want to uh, encrypt in a variable. In this case, would just be the number 1456. Just pass it through that protect uh, method that we mentioned a little while ago. Um, in this case, just null entropy, so no additional secret. And then the current user. So only the current user can encrypt and uh, decrypt it. And then here's just a quick process of um, how it would be. So. Just at the top is that a secret value, just 1456. We'll pass that into secret, give that into the method of um, protect, and then just have it as a current user to encrypt and decrypt, and then print that out. Uh, on the bottom is just a little print function because it's a little fancy. And after that, uh, we unencrypt it. So just same thing but opposite, uh, just using the unprotect. And then uh, once we run it, we'll see at the top is going to be the blob or the uh, decrypted or the encrypted value, which is that 
all those um, values up top. That would be what's saved into the file if um, it's being stored. And then on the bottom is just decrypting it, which would be the 1456. So pretty easy, uh, pretty straightforward. All right, and so uh, now we can talk about how it could get abused. So one of the things that um, I like to do on engagements is um, dump credentials. That's a pretty juicy thing to do. Uh, whenever you're using password managers, by the way, password managers is good to use, a lot better than storing it into just an Excel file, which I see all the time in environments that don't have password managers. So even though we're able to abuse it in dump credentials, any password manager is better than no password manager. So um, in this case, it's going to be looking at Sharp Chrome, which is a popular public tool that's used to dump uh, Chromium-based uh, credentials. And for this one, um, there's going to be two main files that we're going to be looking at, which is called the login state and then the login data. So the login state is what's going to have that uh, key that we're looking for. And the login data is going to be what stores all the credentials and even cookies. So with that key that we get from the login data, we'll use that to uh, decrypt Oh, sorry, the key we get from login state will get uh, to decrypt the login data. And so uh, in the Sharp uh, Chrome code, they just have pretty basic if statements. If it's uh, Chrome, it looks for the location of those values. And if it's um, Edge and Brave, it'll look for a different location of those. Uh, but again, it's looking for that login data and the local, local state file. And on the bottom, as uh, a screenshot of your local state file, uh, so in there is an encrypted key. So in the Sharp Chromium code, it's looking for that encryption, uh, encrypted key value, which is just um, a base 64 encoded of the key that you then have to decrypt. Kind of confusing, but the key's there in that local state file. Sorry, which one was the base 64 encoded? Oh, the uh, encrypted key. So what I have blurred out, I, I should have screenshotted on my... Uh, VM that didn't matter, but this is my real key, so I blurred it out. But that is the uh, uh, thing that's base 64 encoded. Um, it's just a bunch of um, letters, but yeah, it's in there. Uh, so uh, here's the next part of the Sharp Chromium, uh, Sharp Chrome code. Uh, once it gets that key, on the top is the query, uh, the SQL query. It uses a SQL database. Um, so that's the query it's going to be using. And on the bottom, and highlighted in yellow, is whenever um, it uses the key to start decrypting and, and getting the value. Uh, I was going to have a demo, but it's just straightforward, pretty much. You just use Sharp Chrome, uh, pass in logins if you want username and passwords, uh, or cookies if you want cookies, and then the browser, so Edge, Chrome, Brave. And then uh, towards the middle in blue is the state file, so that local state it gets the key and then um, it starts dumping credentials. Feel free to try these credentials. They may or may not work, uh, but they most likely won't work. Uh, and then just real quick, so uh, another way that uh, the Pappy is abused is just in some random documents that I found. So before I learned about the Pappy, um, I learned about the SCCM NAA account. Um, and then once I started learning about the Pappy, I was like, oh, hey, that's like from that blog that I read a while back. So like I said, you just kind of see the Pappy mentioned here and there. So kind of like clear up some uh, things you didn't know before. But with the SCCM NA account, it's a network access account. So whenever you have SCCM in the environment, uh, you need to add computers before they're actually domain joined. So that's where the NA account comes in. Uh, but what's really juicy is if the NA account is a privileged account. So essentially, uh, the, there's a blob on those clients. And it has uh, the Pappy encryption on there. But you need to have um, high privilege on that machine in order to decrypt it. And you pretty much just get the plain text, uh, username and password of the NAA account. Um, I first heard about it by uh, SpectreOps, so I've linked their blog on the bottom uh, to check it out as well as step-by-step -step on how to follow it. Uh, they did a really good job of um, describing it, but I won't go too much into detail on it. Uh, but uh, my favorite thing is the uh, domain backup key. So uh, at the beginning, I mentioned kind of how uh, the user's password is used to uh, create that master key, and the master key is used for session key, which is used for encryption decryption. Well, on domain join machines, it actually creates two, back, uh, two master keys, which is a backup key. So while it's uh, decrypting those uh, data, making those blobs with the user's password, it's also 
encrypting it with uh, the public key on the main controller. So the main controllers have their own private and public key specifically for the PAPI. So it's using that uh, public key to also make a backup master key. And that's in the cases where uh, users who call help desk and they need their password changed. Well, help desk doesn't log onto their computer and then change the password, you know, they're changing it remotely. So uh, through that way, CredFile doesn't get the update. So if it's looking at CredFile, since it wasn't updated on the machine, it's not able to decrypt it. So that's why there's this whole process for uh, backup master key and using the public key of the domain controller to encrypt and decrypt it. Um, and on the bottom is kind of how it will look. So with the DC master key, it kind of just plots there and then just proceeds with the session key, um, encrypted data, and everything as well. Oh, and also uh, what makes it juicy is that the, um, this DC master key, it gets created whenever the domain is first created. But if it gets compromised, there's no way to change that. There's no way to, it's not like a password that you could just change. Um, so once you have the master key, uh, that master key will always, or that backup key will always be the same. Uh, the only way, and this is by Microsoft's uh, documentation, is create a whole new domain, migrate all the users, which nobody's gonna do, so it's, it's great. <laughs> and here's just a quick example. Uh, so on this first machine, uh, here's just the workstation. Uh, there's the uh, workstation name, and then the user Samwise, just a regular user that uses the password manager, a Google password manager. Uh, those are the sites that he has saved, and um, he has his credentials stored on there, username and password. So uh, we compromised a uh, domain admin, which is Gandalf, because he's powerful, so he should be domain admin, and he's on a server called Rivendell, uh, so completely different from that workstation that he's on. And uh, in order to get the backup key, you need to have um, high privilege, like a domain admin access. So you, you gotta get there first. And uh, so on here, I have uh, two tools, which is gonna be Sharp to Pappy and Sharp Chrome. Sharp to Pappy is used to get the master key or the backup key, and then Sharp Chrome is used to dump the credentials. They're on the same GitHub as well. And so first we'll use uh, Sharp to Pappy, just pass it the option, I went a little too fast. I think we're gonna have to start from the beginning. Anyways, uh, you use Sharp to Pappy. Uh, there's different options. We'll be using the option for the backup key. Um, you could also do a search. So uh, you could search through either the registry or um, the files, and it'll just try to decrypt all the files that it could find that are blobs to try to uh, decrypt stuff. Um, but in this case, we'd be using the master key. And then you just uh, point it to the workstation or server that you want to target to try to dump credentials on there. And then it'll just start uh, dumping credentials um, on wherever you give it to. Right there. There we go. And then uh, the first option I have just dumping the key out so you kind of see what the key looks like. Uh, it's uh, targeting, oh, sorry, this case the back piece, so it's targeting the domain controller, which in this case is Mount Doom and it dumps the uh, backup key from that domain controller. And again, this is just outputting it with the slash no wrap option. Um, so next we're gonna save it to a file to make it a little bit easier to work with. Uh, so we can just start passing that key file whenever we're um, dumping credentials. So just pretty much the same command. Um, and then we're just gonna save it to a file called key.pvk, uh, which it works. Backup keys written to key.pvk. Like I mentioned, we'll use that in the next step to um, start dumping credentials. Right, and then we'll be using uh, Sharp Chrome. Again, the logins to dump username and password. Uh, you can also use the cookies, to dump cookies, uh, pass it the key that has the uh, backup key saved in there. And then here's where you target the um, server, which is, or the workstation or server, which is gonna be that first one that Samwise was logged into that uh, uses the password manager. And then once we do that, uh, it shows the host that we targeted, uh, shows that it uses uh, the main, uh, the Pappy backup key, uh, the files that it's targeting. So there's again that local state file uh, grabs the key from there. And then with that key, it goes into the local data file that we mentioned, which is that SQL encrypted file that has um, all these username and passwords. 
and then um, it starts uh, decrypting that as well. So it provides the uh, site that it's used at, uh, the username that was used for that, and then the password uh, that was used for there. And it will go through and try to dump all the credentials that I could find on that machine. Uh, and what's interesting about this is uh, because whenever we're targeting domains and there'll be certain sites uh, like CyberArk or if they have, I don't know, uh, VMware Horizons or whatever, uh, some users will have different accounts or uh, different passwords for those different sites. Uh, so this is great because uh, we're able to get those credentials for each of those sites. And um, that's usually the case because a lot of the password timing is different, so a lot of their um, Password for domain account is not the same as those sites. So it's pretty great. I like it as well. Um, it's what we started doing. It's also really hard to detect. Um, I haven't really came across a solid way to detect it because it's using like an actual function um, that's normal behavior. So I have seen like some detections, but I see that they get a lot of false uh, positives. So if anybody does know, I know there's a lot of blue teamers here, so if anybody does know a good way, uh, please let me know, because so far I haven't found too good of a way, and like I mentioned, once you get this, you can't just change the backup key, so it's, it's a really good um, uh, way to uh, domain um, persist. And then here's a link to the um, slides as well, has uh, my contact, and uh, that pretty much covers it, so I have a little bit of time left for a couple of questions, if anybody has any questions or um, comments or for me to repeat anything. Yeah. How, does, how does that differ from like Rubius or is, is Sharp from you? It, it pretty much is. Uh, whenever I was looking at Sharp Chrome, they mentioned that they're using a lot of uh, code from like Mimikatz and Rubius and all those. Um, so there are different uh, tools out there. Um, this, these are just like specific to these dumping, so that's kind of why it's like its own separate thing. But like if you use Rubius, you could um, also do similar things, or Mimi Cats, um, since those are like older, so those are like the original ones. But, but yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Would you say those are probably more likely to be caught? Like yeah, yeah, it would be a lot more likely to caught. And uh, usually, at least like whenever we go into like red teaming stuff, we kind of try to like narrow stuff down to our tools that just do what we need to do instead of like Mimi Cats, which it was like super hard to run on the machine with the, like a C2. Uh, these we did run through C2s, so that's the only reason we got to work, so you can't just like put it on a file, but uh, usually we like to use like tools like specific towards a certain task because of um, those reasons. I'll put easier. But yeah, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, so the question was kind of how we uh, tell the clients for remediation whenever we dump credentials like this. Uh, it is pretty hard. The biggest thing, uh, and this is general, is having uh, MFA on your internal sites. Uh, so even just generally, MFA on external and then internal is often overlooked because companies like, well, you know, they're already inside, so, you know, it's the same thing. Um, but uh, we usually recommend MFA on those sites. So like CyberArk, for example, um, if they have the credential sorted in here and they have the username and password, uh, you know, we can try to log in. Um, and then MFA, that's not uh, push. So sometimes we do get in where we have the username and password. Uh, and they do have MFA, but it's push. So we just like spam them a few times and eventually like, all right. And then they accept it and let us in. Um, so one that's code base are pretty annoying on our side and great to see. Uh, but yeah, usually MFA on internal sites is our recommendation. Uh, I have time for one more if anybody has another question. Is there a password manager that you find more difficult to exploit? Uh, they each have like the pros and cons. Uh, usually one of the ones like um, one password. I, I haven't seen too many for organizations, but like personally, usually like one of those where it's not like stored on the machine, um, but it is stored somewhere. But you kind of, if that is the case, wherever it's stored, you kind of just lock that down. Um, but yeah, this one's kind of like uh, one of the lower, like the browser ones are kind of one of the lower um, password managers. So uh, like I mentioned, it's better than no password manager because without password managers, I see files on Excels all the time, like their Netflix password and bank passwords, which I can't use, of course, but people store those all the time. But, um, but yeah, those are the password managers would be better. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. But thanks everyone for joining. Um, Hope it was entertaining, and feel free to check out the slides if um, 
me to review anything or reach out to me if you have any questions. But thanks, everybody.